my friends. It is so good to be with you right now. I love you. The Lord loves you. We're going to dive into the topic of rest, a command that God gave us because he loves us so much. And before we do that, we're going to dive into a little bit about what's going on in the world right now and how to handle it. So part of the episode is going to be about stuff you really want to think about. Ah, oh, the love of the Lord and rest. And stuff you don't want to think about. Ah, oh, the hatred of the world for me. <laughs> it's the yin and the yang episode. Thanks for being with us. So we're going to talk about rest, but I really had to, to alter my approach here and dive into some stuff that I'd rather not think about, but it's at our doorstep, so we have to. Uh, you can interrupt my flow at any time by texting your questions to 720-650-0100, and I will answer them because uh, I'm here for you. Uh, so before we dive into the topic at hand, i got to call you to courage right now. Courage. Why? Because, guys... The gloves are off, and it's pretty clear around the abortion debate in our country that there are a lot of people who don't just disagree with you, who aren't open-hearted seekers, but have found something that they've landed on and have decided that they hate you, that they hate you. All right, I'll just read something I just saw on, on, on Twitter uh, not long ago. So there was a, a, a building that serves pregnant women that was burned and vandalized this weekend, and... By the way, this is kind of ironic because the same people who, who accuse pro-lifers of never helping women who have actually had babies, all you care about is women, the babies in the womb, you don't care about babies after they're born, these are the same people attacking the pregnancy centers that give away tens of thousands of diapers. <laughs> Do you see the humor in this? All right, there's, there's really not a sincerity behind when they, when they accuse you of not caring about children after they're born. And by the way, every pro-life organization I know does stuff for kids after they're born. In fact, the most active people Caring for children who are born in crisis pregnancies are pro-lifers. All right, so check this out. There was a person commenting on this online who said, who said, more of this, more of these buildings burning down. May these people never know a moment of peace or safety until they rot in the ground. Guys, a welcome sign outside of your church is probably not going to work for that person because they can Google to find out things that you believe and they can't stand you. And sometimes, you know, my approach to the world is first and foremost to presume that the person who's coming at me like that is just wounded and needs a, a cookie, <laughs> needs a hug, needs that welcome banner. And, you know, that is a good thing to, to have that be your first default, because that's frankly what I want. I want that to be the situation. The sad reality is that's not always a situation. This is from John 3:19. Sometimes, quote, people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Sometimes people just love the sin that they're in and therefore hate you because you come in the way. Now, I think most of the martyrdoms throughout the church, most of the martyrdoms that happened in the early church, it wasn't because they had real, legit, philosophical differences with Christians and therefore I'm going to kill you. It's, it's more on a gut level than that. If they're driven to violence, it's probably because in some way, you're taking away their fun. Those early Christians, the, the lifestyle they preach takes away the things that I like to do with my girlfriend or whatever it is. So therefore, I, I want to I destroy you because you come in the way of the, the sin that I love. I hate the light because, because their deeds are evil. And, and if you live in the light, guys are going to hate you by default. And Jesus warned us that this would happen. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus promised us that this would be the case. So what do we do? One, I want to encourage you to own it. Own it. Guys, the anger that the world is, is focusing on you Catholics right now. I mean, why, why are they spray painting Catholic churches because of a Supreme Court event and how the Supreme Court's thinking of overturning Roe versus Wade? Why, why target us? Because they should target us. Because you know what? I'm to blame. You are to blame. The fact that we believe that God loves us so much that he died for us is the foundation of how we see the world. No, no, no. I'm not pushing for a theocracy. There's no one calling for compulsory Sunday mass attendance. 
but, but public policies and laws that are formed by that worldview. And, and public policies and laws in a society formed and motivated by that worldview is incompatible, and despite all the calls for coexistence, cannot coexist with a society that's built primarily on worship of sexual liberation. And you know, the world sees that. The world sees that, they hate you for it, and they're calling you out. They're calling you out of your silence. They're calling you out of hiding behind this, you know, everybody's welcome and everything's fine. And no, 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 the world's looking at you saying, no, no, not everything's fine. And I know our worldviews don't mix, despite my bumper sticker saying coexist. <laughs> so let's own it. Let's own that. Let's be proud of that because we have the best news in history in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we have as a worldview and as a foundation for the society we're trying to build is better. It's better than a society that would literally throw children in the trash. Uh, two, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Now, some people would say, you know, Chris, we shouldn't call any person our enemies. There's only one enemy. It's the devil. Okay. I've actually preached that before, but uh, recent events <laughs> have me re-looking at this and say, no, no, wait. Actually, Jesus said, love your enemies which means that you have them. If you didn't have enemies that were people, he, he wasn't saying love demons. The difference with Christian life is not whether or not we have enemies. It's what we do with our enemies. What we do is love them. So love your enemies. And I asked a, 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 an archbishop who's a friend of mine what I should do if, if people come and, and protest in my church. And he said, I find that what really gets them is when you remain calm and tell them that Jesus loves them and he gave his life for you. So that totally throws them. I kind of love that plan. So <laughs> love your enemies. Tell them you love them. Tell them the Lord loves them. But I'd also say this, guys. Uh, number three, speak clearly and draw your boundaries. See, when the world is pushing you out of that place of silence, that place where you can pretend that all these different worldviews can coexist, go ahead and go there and, and, and while loving people, speak the truth with clarity. Love and truth have to go together, by the way. See, if there's all truth and no love, that's a form of cruelty. If there's all love and welcome and no truth to form boundaries and yeses and nos and clear moral teachings, that's just sentimentality. That's not actual love. Love and truth have to go together. When they do get, go together, when you have this unbending truth and this undying love, what you get is a very uncomfortable situation where the Lord is calling us to be. So own it. Love your enemies, but don't stop preaching the truth to them. Even if they don't want to hear it, preach the truth to them. No, I, I don't think you should have a right to destroy a living child inside of a womb, even if you really, 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 really want that right. No, frankly, I don't need to debate you about why I think that. I, I don't, because if the end of your logical conclusion is, if, if where all your, all your logical arguments land is the conclusion that it is therefore okay to dismember a human being, puncture the base of the skull, suck the brain out, collapse the skull, throw it in the trash. Sorry for being graphic. This is what happens, though. If that's the, the end of your argument, I don't have to get into the argument with you as if it's so complicated. And you, don't, you just don't understand how, how multifaceted and complex this is. That's not complicated at all. I could stand at your conclusion and say, you know, no, everything that led here, I could tell you is wrong. Nazis had logical constructs that led them to what they believed. I could stand at what they concluded and say, yeah, I'm looking back from here, and I could tell you you're wrong. Own it. Love your enemies, but with no apology, because you can't soften your words anymore. The world is not letting you speak the truth in love. Am I calling you to be a culture warrior? No, I'm calling you to be a preacher of the gospel. Guys, it's funny how how so many people label devout Christians as ultra-conservative culture warriors. Guys, the stuff that, that we believe, <laughs> all of mankind has believed this from the dawn of history. All right? There's been exceptions, but for the most part, people would think that an act like abortion is morally abhorrent until about 50 years ago. For the most part, until 2015, almost all of human history, people believed that marriage was male and female in every culture throughout history. In fact, 2008, President Obama said, yeah, I don't, I don't believe in same-sex marriage. This is everybody. Guys, the culture warriors are people who are coming to our doorstep. Now, I, I, I'm a loving guy. I'm an evangelist. I want to always lead with welcome. I want to always lead with, 
come on in, the doors are wide open. And I'm kind of, I, I, confession, I could be kind of a codependent guy sometimes too. So I don't want to make people feel bad. This goes against my nature as a person. Uh, but the culture war that others are waging has come to your doorstep. It's come to your kids' classrooms, and it's come to your churches. My parents went to church uh, this weekend, and there's stuff spray painted on the door. 666, and, and my body, my choice, and all this stuff. It's come to you. So let's stop pretending. Amen? All right, now. Whew, it's heavy. It's heavy, man. I don't enjoy this at all. But the Lord promised me I wouldn't always enjoy it, so there it is. Let's talk about rest. Rest. Uh, by the way, if you haven't got my book, Living Joy, you absolutely need it. One of the rules for living joy is rest. And this actually is a great, uh, this, is, this coincides well with the Bible, because God gave us 10 moral rules to live by. And one of them has everything to do with setting aside your work to worship God and to rest, to keep holy the Sabbath. Now, I got to be honest with you. When God laid out the commandments, this is probably the one commandment that he was, he was looking down at humanity and thinking, really? I got to make this a command? <laughs> Are you serious? Wait, hold on. I have to actually attach punishment to this one to make sure you'll do it? Yes, Lord, this is how stupid we all are, but thank you for loving us anyway. And this command, which has changed countless lives and leads to our happiness, started a revolution. Check this out. This is from Exodus 5.1. God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And what? Let them go and hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Let my people party. Let my people worship me and celebrate life together. Why did this cause a revolution? Because this command, when it was obeyed, sent a message to Pharaoh that, you know what? We don't ultimately exist for you. We human beings don't exist for worldly kings. We don't exist for our work. We are not cogs in a societal machine. And this is a summary of all Catholic social, and political teaching. That the wheels of society are turning to serve man. Man does not exist to keep the wheels turning. That if there's such a thing as work, as science, as all, all these things, as, as pleasure, as prosperity, all these things exist to serve us. We don't exist to serve those things. And to sum up all these Catholic social teachings, God has put us on a throne of dignity this high. Don't you dare try to take us down. And the command to rest reinforces that dignity, that we rise above all these things. When we forget God and when we forget that command, we become cogs in, in, the, in the turning wheels of society. We get ground up in it all. We start to become objects for people's pleasure, objects literally for science. So the, the, the command to rest, it reminds us of, of who we are. It reminds us of who we are. Now, a couple of things happen when we forget this command to rest. First, we forget who we are. We stop being human beings and become human doings. And sometimes we reduce ourselves even in our most important relationships. And I could see how you could fall into that with really important relationships in your life. You know, there was uh, one pastor who met my, uh, my mom. And she, my mom was in a youth group with my little sister. And he said, what's your name? And she said, I'm Elizabeth's mom. And he said, who? And she said, I'm Elizabeth's mom. No, wait, who are you? Elizabeth's mom. Who are you? Oh, I'm Mary. And he said, yes, you're Mary. <laughs> you're more. You're more than the stuff you do, more than the stuff you accomplish, more than the functions that you have in your family. Satan means accuser. In Revelation, the devil's called the accuser of our brothers. It's okay to reduce him to a function. It's okay to reduce the evil one to what he does. Now, there are some, some functions in your life are beautiful, like mother, don't get me wrong, but that's not all that you are. That's not all that you are. We forget who we are when we forget to set aside work and not only worship and go to Mass on Sunday, but to truly and deeply rest. And I got a confession for you guys. I work too dang hard sometimes. And it sends my kids a message that sometimes they forget who they are because of that. I'm right, getting real with you here, man. I, I have told my kids more than most parents how much I love them, how proud I am of them. I make it a point to tell my kids I'm proud of them when they've done nothing great. Why? Because you're mine. I think it sends a beautiful and powerful message to my kid. But I, I've seen my children at various times in their teenage years 
Yeah, I'm getting older. <laughs> my, my youngest just hit double digits the other day. Woohoo! But I've seen my kids struggle sometimes with just working too hard, not resting enough, and it looks like they're trying to prove themselves. And I'm like, man, I, I, I'm like Mr. Um, you know, participation medal dad. Uh, what are you doing? It looks like you're, you're exhausting yourself as if you don't think you're enough unless you accomplish something. And I had an honest conversation with my daughter. He's like, yeah, th dad, that was kind of you in a lot of ways. You, told, you, you could tell us you love us so much. But if the message you send with how hard you work sometimes is go, 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 you don't mean to, Dad, if you're being a little bit of a workaholic at times, and I'm not, I'm not full-blown crazy at that, but it, it's there, it's real. Um, you don't mean to, but you do end up sending a message to your kids that they should not rest and that they, they have to hit certain accomplishments to be worthy of love. I had a great question that came in. How do we rest when we have so much going on, even outside of work, cooking, dinner, laundry, mowing the lawn, cleaning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, look, the things that are on that list you will always have them there. If you make rest a priority, you will do it. You, if you say, I will get to my rest and self-care when all those other things are done, you will never do it. There's always dirt on the floor. There's always dishes in the sink. More than needing a clean floor, your kids need a happy mom. More than needing all the dishes done, your kids need a happy dad. You know, and, 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 and this is something I could fall into in my work. There's always emails to answer. So if I'm home on a Sunday, like, just give me five minutes, just gonna answer it real quick. It's always there. But point number two, this is what happens when you don't rest. You miss out on the best things in life. You miss out on everything. A friend of mine had a, had a vision in prayer. Not with his eyes open, but just the Lord was leading him in his imagination. And, I, and it, he planted this in my mind by sharing it with me, and it hasn't left. And I want to plant it in your mind right now. In the Old Testament, when God's people were going through the desert, um, God sent them manna from heaven. He provided for their needs. And they wake up every day, and this manna uh, was just, it was like these little the crackers all over the place that provided for all their nutritional needs. They would gather it, and they would eat it. But God commanded them, don't gather enough for two days. I got you. I got you. I got you. Every single day, I got you. And if you gather enough for two days, well, whatever else you gather for the second, third, fourth day, all your work is wasted. It's going to rot. So my friend was contemplating this, because guaranteed, there were people who didn't obey that command out of a lack of trust for God. They didn't let themselves rest. So my friend in his vision was, was just contemplating how there was this beautiful Jewish family outside their tent with a fire burning, and they were enjoying their manna, and the parents were happy. And the kids were just relaxed, and they were cracking jokes together and enjoying the moment that they were in. And in the tent next door, there was a family that wasn't letting themselves rest. Because what if God doesn't provide tomorrow? And they looked stressed and heavy-hearted. And it was 10 p.m. and the kids were still out gathering manna, which all ended up rotting the next day anyway. They missed out on the best things in life. Isn't that how you live your life sometimes? I gotta do, I gotta go, I gotta, I gotta prepare for the future, I gotta look ahead. God has got you. I mean, living as if there's no God who's got you is a completely pagan, anti-Christian way to live. We don't just recognize that God is a force in heaven. He's your heavenly Father, and He loves you. And I think Jesus walked through life with that heart that was present to the moment that He was in. And it was retreating and resting in, in, in deep prayer that kept Him there. You know, Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in the desert for 40 days. Then before Luke 4 is over, he goes and starts his public ministry in the seas of Galilee. And by the end of Luke chapter 4, it says he went to the desert to pray. He was constantly doing it. But the time between that prayer, I guarantee you, though he was focused and mission-driven, he was always present to the step he was on. He was always present to the person in front of him. He was never racing through Capernaum. Someone comes up to him, hey, Lord, heal my, heal my daughter. Yeah, hold on. I gotta make a. I gotta answer a text. What, what were you saying about your daughter? Oh yeah, no problem. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. I got a flight to catch to a TEDx conference. That's not how we live. It's how we live sometimes, and we actually think that's important and good. We actually brag about being busy. What is up with that? How you doing? Busy. How much rest is too much rest? When does rest become laziness? Is the question that just came in. Um, you know, if if your if your basics aren't getting done. Uh, you know, if, I, if I'm not providing for my family, I'm being lazy. 
the Lord's calling me to provide. But there's a, this balance, this constant balance between providing and knowing he's my father. Between, um, you know, there's no, there's not, flies aren't flying around my house. Okay? There's not maggots in the trash. Okay, I'm not saying, like, get that bad. Well, the Lord's going to take my trash out. No, he's not. <laughs> All right? But you've got to be okay with a little imperfection and a little dirtiness. And I think most of us, though, to be fair, uh, go to the other extreme. We just never stop. We never rest. So what happens when we don't rest? We forget who we are. We miss out on the best things in life. And then three, we burn out. We burn out. Guys, re- remember the person that your wife fell in love with? Remember the person your, your, your husband fell in love with? Where is he? Life gets so stinking busy that that guy, you kill him. He, he burns out. He, he's, he's gone. I, and this is whether you're married or whether you're a priest. I know there's some good priest friends of mine who watch this. Yeah, I had a priest. Uh, I talked about rest and about self-care. And this young priest came up to me and cried on my shoulder after I talked about this for a while. Literally cried on my shoulder. He's like, thank you for saying that. Because I'm a shell of the man I used to be. And if I don't take time to be inspired, I can't be inspiring to anybody. So how do you stop yourself from burning out? It's not, it's not just about resting and stopping work. It's about doing things that refuel you. Do you give yourself time for those things? Uh, someone just texted in, do we live in a society where busy equals important slash purpose? Yes. I think that's at the source of all of this. I think, it's, I think it's that we're working so that we matter. And a lot of Christians fall into this, and I can fall into it myself sometimes. Our wounds lead to workaholism. We want to accomplish so that we matter. We want to have an X, X amount of zeros in the bank account so that we matter. Or if you're in ministry, I want to have X, Y, and Z books written so that I matter. The book will live beyond me. The t- you matter because your Heavenly Father loves you. You matter Listen to me. You matter because your Heavenly Father loves you. You're a child of the Most High God. And it's really hard to actually, on a gut level, believe that and live out of that reality. When you do, you enjoy life more. This isn't just the path to holiness. This is the path to living joy. (laughs) Book plug. So how? How do you do it, guys? A, a, a couple really simple things. And you know, most of the uh, advice, I lay this out in the book, Living Joy, in the program, which you can get by texting the word JOY to 44144. How do you do it? One, you need a little work ritual. The Jews had, had a lot of rituals to mark sacred time. Now, we go to sacred spaces, we know we're entering a church. But time can be made sacred. Time can be set apart. God set the Sabbath apart. He set Sunday apart as the day to rest, to stop working, and to worship Him. And we need to enter that time with intentionality. Now, the Jews do it with incredible intentionality. The Orthodox Jews to this very day, to the point where it's, it's legalistic and almost burdensome. And that's why Jesus had to correct this. And He said, man does not exist for the Sabbath. The Sabbath exists for man. Examples you could see to this day, uh, come with me to Israel someday. But on, on the Sabbath, you'll see that they have something called a Sabbath elevator. It's pretty intense. I, I, my first time in Israel, uh, there was a, a family as, uh, of Orthodox Jews in the elevator, and they were just standing there with the door open. And I heard, bing, bing, bing. And they were waiting for the doors to close to bring them up to the next floor where they would go through the same process until they reached their floor. Now, I saw this happening, and I, I went to the elevator and said, hey, I'm going to push a button for you. And, and the guy's like, uh, it's a Sabbath elevator you dumb tourist, right? And then I, I learned, okay, oh, okay, step off. This is a thing. Um, <laughs> now, I, I could look at that and say, well, those people take work, rest too seriously. They consider pushing the button work. But what's more extreme, guys? What's more off the mark here? How seriously they take work or how not seriously I take work uh, and rest, rather. How seriously they take rest or how not seriously most of us take rest. Do you set the, side, uh, set, uh, the time aside, make it sacred, and actually stick to it? Now, here's what I do. This is a, a thing I, I do on a daily basis and a thing I do when I enter the Sabbath. Right? So there's the rest that happens each day, and there's the rest that happens when I know this is sacred time. It's Sunday. I'm not going to work. I literally will close my laptop, and I will say out loud, and this is so stupidly simple, but it actually works. I say it out loud so my brain can hear it. I say, work done. I close my laptop. It's a tip I got from a book I read uh, called Deep Work. During that Sabbath, I fail at this sometimes. I'm confessing to you here. 
I don't want to check my, my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I don't want to check my email. Not once. Not once. There's something called attention residue. Every time you're derailed by a little, a little distraction, it takes you about 20 minutes to get back to the same level of focus you had before that distraction. Think of how tragic that is when it's applied to your family time. Uh, what, what's the big deal if I just check my, just check my, my work email, my addiction? Just every 20 minutes, what's the big deal? You never actually focus on your kids ever your whole life. You have to set that time aside. Come up with a little ritual and actually stick to it. And so that's number one. You need a ritual, set the time aside. Number two, don't rest lazily. The word for school comes from the Greek word for relaxation. Isn't that cool? And Joseph Pieper, Piper, I forget how to pronounce the name. Great philosopher. He wrote a book called uh, uh, Leisure, the Basis of Civilization. Peeper. Peeper? I think Peepers, yes. Uh, the, thank you. I got my, my sound booth guys telling me my ears. Peepers. And if I got it wrong, did you get that right? I think you did. Leisure, the Basis of Civilization. Did I get the book title right? This is what happens when you have philosophy and theology master's degree students in the sound booth running the show with me. It's awesome. <laughs> This is the basis of civilization. The basis of civilization is not work, 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 and more work. Storytelling, ritualizing, book writing, philosophy, all those things arose from a culture that knew how to put work aside, hang out, and just be in the moment together. So that's what, when we remember this, where the word relaxation even comes from, it's a good reminder not to rest lazily but to rest in a way that actually refuels your soul. Now, what do I mean by that? Here's an example of lazy rest. Well, I don't have any work to do, so I will scroll on my phone all day long on Sunday. It's lazy. It's lazy. Now, your brain naturally tends toward this because you always want to burn less calories. It's, it's something we evolved to do. Your brain actually burns calories. And the harder you think, the harder you work on actual real activities, the more calories are burned. So if you want a simple distraction from your everyday work, what you usually do is shallow, quote, work. All right? And, and so it's a certain type of, uh, that was to answer that question that came in before, this is a certain type of laziness. It's a spiritual laziness that actually, ironically, prevents you from deep rest. Engage in activities that are actually meaningful. Plan some with your family. Play a board game together that actually might take some time, but it isn't just scrolling images. Read a book. Do things that lift up your spirit. I, I, uh, a dear friend of mine, Pat Lencioni, he's a great business author. He gives me a lot of free coaching, which I could, I mean, dude, Pat's like telling Southwest Airlines and stuff how to run their business. So I, it's, it's not uh, something I could afford if he didn't provide it for free because he's a good Catholic. Thank you, Pat. This episode was sponsored by The Table Group. So anyway, you know, I, I went and visited him recently, and, and he's like, you know, you're looking a little burnout. What you need is a refuel. Before we get to the stuff about strategizing about your ministry, let's record a quick podcast. I'm like, I don't want to add that to my to-dos. No, we're going to do a podcast. I did a podcast, totally refueled me. And sitting down and looking at the ceiling didn't refuel me because this is the kind of guy I am. Doing that, having that meaningful, fun interaction with him refueled me. What kind of things fuel you and give you life? Is it working out? Is it watching the sunset? Is it reading the book? Is, is it all these different things? Guys, I, I just, I want to give you permission to do those things in those days of rest. And I want, to, I want to encourage you to be intentional about doing those things on your days of rest. When you don't rest, you feel like the hero, you feel like the martyr, but all you're doing is leaving the people around you with is, is the most burnt out version of yourself. That's all they get. And there's nothing noble, good, or beautiful about that. God calls us to deep rest. Why? Because he loves us, because he wants us to be happy, because he made us for eternal joy. And without that deep rest, we're just surviving. I love you guys. It was good to be with you. That time went really fast. We will see you next time. Man, wasn't that great? Listen, if you don't want to be happy, be sure not to subscribe. But if you want a more joyful life, the kind of life that God created you for, the kind of life Jesus promised when he said, I came to give you life to the full, then make sure you hit subscribe and share this channel with everybody you know.